Welcome back to Chapter 17, Part 2. We are talking about the most diverse group, uh, the most diverse phylum, arthropoda, arthropods, and there are four main groups, arachnids. Examples of arachnids include spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites. You've got crustaceans, such as crabs, lobsters, crayfish, shrimp, and barnacles. So there's the shrimp and there's some barnacles. Fun fact about barnacles, they have the longest penis proportional to their body size. Cool species of crustacean is the mantis shrimp. They are really neat. Uh, they can see many more portions of wavelengths of light than we can. They make very loud noises underwater. They can attack their prey by uh, using their claw and then they move it so fast that it makes this really loud noise. The water around it actually boils and it punches the fish, for example. There are really funny videos out there done by this guy, of Frank. True facts about different animals. I highly suggest them. They're not super safe for kids, but they are hilarious. And you do learn a lot about different animals. There's a lot of really fun ones. A fun fact about lobsters is that they have blue blood. Because their hemoglobin, instead of using iron, uses copper. And since they are arthropods, the bigger that they get, they have to molt that exoskeleton. So lobsters, for example, the bigger the lobster you're eating, the older it is. And each time it molts, it goes through a stage where that new exoskeleton is really soft and it is uh, more likely to be preyed upon by other animals. Next group we have is millipedes and centipedes. Only the largest centipedes bite. Uh, millipedes uh, bite and break through skin. Millipedes don't bite. They dry out quickly, so if they get in their your house, they'll usually dry out and curl up into the ball that they curl up into. And last, we have insects. Insects are very diverse. They have three parts, uh, body, a head, thorax, and abdomen. They are very important as part of the ecosystem. They're part of the food chain. They can be pollinators. They've got lots of diverse ground beetles and they can have some amazing social structures. Many insects undergo metamorphosis. That means a transformation. And there are two ways that they can do it. There's either a hemi or a homometabolis. A uh, hemi is partial, where they'll go from like smaller instars to a bigger version of the same animal, uh, the same insect. Or you can have this holometabolis, where they undergo this full transformation from one very different looking insect to another, like the butterfly does. Why evolutionarily would this be advantageous? Uh, a couple of ideas there, the biggest being that they don't compete for the same food. So this monarch caterpillar and the adult butterfly, different food sources, leaves versus nectar. Next phylum, Phylum mollusca mollusks. So these are going to be uh, soft bodied animals that are sometimes protected by a hard shell. Phylum mollusca is really cool. We're going to look at the different classes there and the different animals that compose each. So the body of a mollusk, mollusk has three parts. First, you've got the foot that acts as a motion area, it has the nerves. You've got the visceral mass. So think about what's in your viscera your organs that do like your heart, your kidney, reproduction, digestive tract, and then you've got the mantle. So the mantle can be hardened with calcium or it can be soft. That's the shell. So the first class of mollusks are gastropods. Those are snails or slugs. They can be aquatic or terrestrial. They can live in either. They're going to be hermaphrodites uh, that can reproduce sexually or asexually. So those ones are a good one to look at when you're comparing the advantages of each mode of reproduction. Bivalves, so those are like clams, oysters, scallops. They can, they have two halves and their middle portion is their body. One of the most endangered bivalves is the giant clam. It can be over 500 pounds. Uh, the oldest one that they found was in Iceland and they named it Ming because originally they thought it was from the Ming Dynasty time. Uh, and they found that it was born in 1499, plus or minus two years. And the last class of mollusks are cephalopods. 
which are the coolest animals ever. So they may or may not have a shell. These include octopus, cuttlefish, uh, squid, and this, for example, is the mimic octopus. So the mimic octopus lives in the waters of Indonesia, and it mimics other animals. It, um, it mimics what they look like as well as their behavior. So here it's being a flounder, a very flat fish, and it even swims along the bottom as that flat fish flounder would. And then it acts like the dragonfish, which is poisonous, so if you eat it, you die. And this is the sea snake that it's acting as, and it puts its legs only two out, and it moves the one around like the head of a sea snake. Very venomous. Venomous means if it bites you, you die. All to survive better. Another cool thing that these creatures have is what are called chromatophores. So on their skin, they have these different color and texture cells that can change over time. Within seconds, chromatophores changes very quickly. You can even have a cuttlefish that can do UV reflections that are really cool. And here is a cuttlefish. They have uh, their mantle in the inside and that's what like fish will have in their cage sometimes, a cuddle bone from the cuttlefish that uh, is their mantle. So there you can see the cuttlefish and how they can change their colors and they can even stripe. And this flashing is not the light, that's the cuttlefish. So you can see they can change both the color and texture of their skin. They are also highly intelligent. Octopi are great problem solvers. They can identify different pictures. They can unscrew themselves from inside a lid. They can go through mazes and learn. Very, very intelligent creatures. The next item we'll look at is phylum echinodermata or echinoderms. These ones have spiny surfaces, so sea star, sand dollars, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. The sea star is really cool in that it has regenerative powers, uh, properties, where if you cut off one leg, one arm, you can grow out a new sea star, which is very neat. Uh, they're all marine. They don't have any body segmentation. They generally have an endoskeleton, this inner skeleton. And they have a cool water vascular system, so vascular vessel system, that helps with their gas exchange and waste disposal. Another fun true facts is true facts about the sea pig. That's a sea cucumber, and it talks about their vascular system there. So that's a kind of derms. Now let's get into vertebrates. So everything up until this point was invertebrates. They didn't have any backbone. So vertebrates, we've got mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes. So we're going to look at their specific features and their phylogenetic tree. So most vertebrates fall into the phylum chordata. And we'll look at the different traits that you have to have to be in this phylum. The only other animals that are considered chordates but not vertebrates are lancelets and tunicates. They're both marine uh, filter feeders. You'll usually find lancelets burrowed most of the way into the ground there, and they'll filter here. They're what we uh, believe are very similar to the ancestors of all vertebrates look like. And tunicates. They can either live in colonies and bud off asexually or sexually. So what do we mean by chordate? What is it? First, you've got a dorsal ho hollow nerve cord. So dorsal means it's on the back. And nerve cord, it becomes our nervous system, our central nervous system, our brain, our spinal cord. Next, you've got the notochord. The notochord, so that's a harder, more fibrous portion. In humans, that becomes our inner vertebral discs, so like your spinal vertebrae. Pharyngeal gill slits. So you might say, you know, people don't have gill slits, but we did. During development in the womb, you had gill slits. 
And what those do is those fuse as you develop into part of your larynx, uh, your hyoid, uh, the bone connected to your tongue, your inner ear bones. In fact, in adults sometimes you can find they have a little hole here where their gill slit didn't fully fuse. I've actually had a few students who have had this or a few with their uh, children as well. This is from the documentary Your Inner Fish. It's on Netflix. This is Neil Shubin, who's a really cool scientist. It's a really well done three-part series. I highly suggest it uh, going through how we can learn from the anatomy of other animals about ourselves and what we have in common. It's really, really great. And then the last hallmark is a post-anal tail. So we've got our tailbone there. It's less accentuated than other vertebrates, but we do have a tail. So there you can see the different parts, the dorsal hollow nerve cord, you can see the brain there with it, the notochord, like our inner vertebral discs, the pharyngeal gill slit. So think of pharynx, that's your throat. So it's slits by your throat, and then a postanal tail. So we're going to look at evolution through vertebrates. We're going to look at the different adaptations that occurred throughout the way. So we're going to start out a long ways back, over 500 million years ago. So fishes started evolving in the early Cambrian period. They didn't totally take off and have their like heyday until the Devonian a little bit later, but let's look at the types of fish that were here. So you first have your jawless fish, the agnathans. Uh, today you can see them as lampreys. So they have these suckers that they attach to. I saw one fight with a snake, and it was really interesting. It kept attaching to the snake so the snake couldn't swallow it. It was a very vicious battle. They're very strong. They can be found in rivers around here. The two uh, major groups of fishes, after the jawless, you've got the cartilaginous chondrichthys. So chondrocytes are your cartilage cells. Whereas osteichthys, bony fish. Osteo means bone. Your osteocytes are your bone cells. So the cartilaginous fish think sharks. Bony fish think other fish that you're familiar with, like clownfish. Uh, fun fact there, clownfish, female, male, uh, it changes. Smaller fish are males, and there's like one female. And then once she dies or moves on, the next biggest becomes a female. So in Finding Nemo, uh, what would have actually happened if the female fish had died, Marlin would have uh, feminized and replaced her. So cartilaginous fish have a really cool uh, electrical conducting system in there. They've got what are called ampullae of Lorenzini in the front portion of their nose that can sense electrical signals. And then they have a lateral line system that tells them how vibrations are moving. They've done really cool experiments with sharks where they've put flounder under the sand and they've put electrical signals under the sand. Ah, dead flounder, sorry. And they went for the electrical signals. That's what they were using as their honing in portion rather than just the smell. Bony fishes have a skeleton with hard calcium. They do also have that lateral line that's how they function in schools. And they've got their operculum, and operculum flares where their gills stick out. So when we're thinking about eyes, these eyes are all underwater. So most bony fishes are what are called ray finned. So like in Nemo, those, those portions of his fin had multiple bones connecting in. It was like a, a sun's rays going in. Whereas you've got lung fishes that have lungs similar to terrestrial animals, a little more primitive. So they're sh thought to share a common ancestor with early terrestrial animals. And then you've got lobe fin fishes. So these have pairs of fins, but in this case they only have one bone going in. Most of these are extinct. They found uh, 7 meters or over 20 feet long one of these in Scotland in fossils. They, they were big in the Carboniferous. Uh, today, you've just got the coelacanths there. Most are ex 
extinct.